Hey everybody, this is Deb with Truthfication Chronicles, and this is part six of the Louis Gohmert article on Mueller. It's called Mueller Unmasked, and there are just so many things that Louis Gohmert knew about Robert Mueller back in April of 2018, and he wanted to make sure everybody else knew it. So he wrote this, and then it was disseminated among the Republicans, so everybody could read it and see what was going on. Now, a lot of people have known about this, but they haven't actually sat down and read it. And so I thought, well, I'm going to go through it and I'll add in some little bits and pieces to kind of help you fill in the blanks in case there are things that he says that you're not familiar with. And there were things that he was talking about that I'd never heard of before, too. So I, you know, it's helping me as well as I went through it. You know, the first time I went through, I just kind of glossed over it. But now I'm going through and I'm digging into these different topics. And this particular one, it has to do with the Muslim connection and how Robert Mueller was interacting with the Muslim community. And this was really, you know, part of what he was doing. And Louis Gohmert called him out on it. So let's get into this. And as always, the links are down below in the description. You may have to click something to make the description open up. And all the links that I use will be down there. However, if it's a link that Louis Gohmert has included in here, I don't necessarily include that because you can download this document and then you can click on those links there. I also want to remind you real quickly of the ability to speed things up. There's a way to make the speed go faster because you can listen faster than I can read. So if you're somebody who's pressed for time and you want to do that, you know, I don't sound too bad as a chipmunk, <laughs> but I recommend it. You know, I am not offended in any way, shape or form if you speed me up because there's so much information out there these days. We all need to take advantage of the time that we have. So this one may end up being kind of long because there's so much to it, but here we go. So Mueller's community partnership with DOJ alleged co-conspirators of terrorism. Yeah. In 2011, and remember who was president in 2011, in one of the House Judiciary Committee's oversight hearings, FBI Director Mueller repeatedly testified during questioning by various members about how the Muslim community was just like every other religious community in the United States. He also referenced an outreach program the FBI had with the Muslim community. When it was my turn to question, I could not help but put the two points of his testimony together for a purge question. Now, I'm going to play the clip for this because I found it. But, uh, you know, if you've got the document before you, you can follow along in that. But I thought you'd love to hear Louis Gomert actually asking the question. So here we go. Thank you, Mr. Marino. We will now go to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gomert, for his questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Director. Sir. Nice to see you back. Um, you had mentioned earlier that, um, uh, and, and it's in your written statement, that you, the FBI has developed extensive outreach to uh, Muslim communities. In answer to an earlier question, I'd understood you to say that, um, you know, Muslim communities were like all other communities. Uh, so I'm curious, uh, as, as a result of the extensive outreach program the FBI has had to the Muslim community, how has your outreach program gone, gone with the Baptists and the Catholics? I'm not certain that I necessarily the thrust of the, the, uh, the question. I would say there are outreach to all segments of a, a particular city or county or society uh, is good. Well, do you have a particular program of outreach to Hindus, Buddhists, Jewish community, agnostics, or is it just an yeah. extensive no, we have, we have outreach, outreach program to... We have outreach to every one of those communities. And how do you uh, do that? Every one of those communities can be affected can be affected by, uh, by, by, uh, by facts or circumstances. I, I've looked extensively, and I haven't seen anywhere in anyone from the FBI's letters, information, that there's been an extensive outreach program to any other community um, trying to develop trust in this kind of relationship. And it makes me wonder if there is an issue of trust or some problem like that 
that the FBI has seen in that particular community? I, I would say if you look at uh, one of our more effective tools are what we call citizens academies, where we bring in uh, individuals from uh, uh, a variety of segments of the uh, of the uh, of the territory in which the uh, office operates. And if you okay, well, that, if you director, look, I've only got five minutes, and so I need okay. your answers to be very quick. Look at the Citizens Academy. The persons there, they 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 are a cross section of the community. They can be okay. Muslim, they can be Indian, they can be Baptist. Okay. They can be Otherwise, but no specific programs to any of those. You have extensive outreach to Muslim community, and then you have a, a program of outreach to communities in general is what it sounds like. But let me ask you. Are you aware so there's Louis himself, and he says, We went further in the questioning. The 2007 trial of the Holy Land Foundation, the largest terrorism financing trial in American history, linked the Council on American-Islamic Relations, CARE, to the Palestinian terrorist organization Hamas. CARE was named as an unindicted co-conspirator in the case. Because of this affiliation, the FBI issued policy and guidance to restrict its non-investigative interactions with CARE in an effort to limit CARE's ability to exploit contacts with the FBI. As a result, FBI field offices were instructed to cut ties with all local branches of CARE across the country. And here's the clip on that. What it sounds like. But let me ask you, are you aware of the evidence in the Holy Land Foundation case that linked the Council on American Islamic Relations, CARE, the Islamic Society of North America, and the North America Islamic Trust to the Holy Land Foundation? Uh, I, I'm not going to speak to uh, specific uh, information in a particular case. I would tell you, on the other hand, that uh, we do not have. Are you aware formal, of the case? We do Director, not have any formal it is relationship with CARE because of concerns. Well, I've got the letter from the assistant uh, director. Uh, Richard Powers that says in light of the evidence talking about during the trial evidence was introduced to demonstrate a relationship among care individual care founders including its current president emeritus and executive director and the Palestine committee evidence was also introduced to demonstrate a relationship between the Palestine committee and Hamas which was designated as a terrorist organization in 1995 in light of that evidence he says the FBI suspended all formal contacts between care and FBI well, now, it's my understanding, and I've got documentation, and I hope you've seen this kind of documentation before. It's public record. And also, the memo order from the judge is turning down a request that the unindicted co-conspirators be eliminated from the list. And he says the FBI's information is clear. There is a tie here, and I'm not going to grant the deletion of these particular parties as unindicted co-conspirators. So I'm a little surprised that you're reluctant to to discuss something that's already been set out as an order, that's already been in a letter saying we cut ties in light of the evidence at this trial. I'm just surprised it took the evidence that the FBI had being introduced at the trial in order to sever the relationships with CARE that it had that showed going back to 1993 meeting in Philadelphia what was tied to a terrorist organization. So I welcome your, your comments about that. Well, as I told you before, we have no formal relationship uh, with CARE because of concerns, concerns with regard to the national leadership. What Director Mueller was intentionally deceptive about was that the FBI had apparently maintained a relationship and even community partnership instigated on his watch with CARE and other groups and individuals that his FBI had evidence showing they were co-conspirators to terrorism. That, of course, is consistent with his misrepresentation that Mueller's FBI had outreach programs to other religious communities, just like they did with the Muslim community. They did not. He was not honest about it. I mean, I laughed when he said, well, what about the Baptists? <laughs> I just had to laugh because it was such a perfect question to ask. Oh, you go, Louie. Man, you did a great job. In a March 2009 Senate Judiciary Committee hearing, Senator John Kyle, and he's from Arizona, 
questioned Mueller over the FBI move to cut off contact with CARE. Mueller responded to Kyle's pressing over how the policy was to be handled by FBI field offices and headquarters with the following. Now, I could not find the clip on this one. I really searched for it, and it's kind of weird that there was only one hearing with Mueller in it in 2009, and it was in September, so it was after this. So you'll just have to put up with me, I guess. Anyway, <laughs> Mueller said, we try to adapt when we have situations where we have an issue with one or more individuals, as opposed to institution or an institution large, to identify the specificity of those particular individuals or issues that need to be addressed. We will generally have individuals may have some maybe leaders in the community who we have no reason to believe whatsoever are involved in terrorism but may be affiliated in some way, shape, or form with an institution about which there is some concern and which we have to work out a separate arrangement. We have to be sensitive to both the individuals as well as the organization and try to resolve the issues that may prevent us from working with a particular organization. And then Kyle asked, they try to adapt with members of terror-related groups? Are they as sensitive with other organizations? Do they work out separate arrangements with members of, say, the Mafia or the Ku Klux Klan for community outreach? Why the special treatment for radical Islamic terrorism? Well, then he goes on, he says, A March 2012 review of FBI field office compliance with this policy by the Office of Inspector General found a discrepancy between the FBI's enforcement policy restricting contact and interaction with CARE and its resulting actions. Rather than FBI headquarters enforcing the rules, they hedged. Mueller set up a separate cover through the Office of Public Affairs and allowed them to work together, despite the terrorist connections. That was the cultivated atmosphere of Mueller's FBI. The DOJ actually set out in writing in an indictment that CARE and some of the people Mueller was coddling were supporters of terrorism. I had understood that the plan by the Bush Justice Department was that if they got convictions of the principals in the Holy Land Foundation trial, we're going to talk about that in a minute, they would come right back after the co-conspirators who were named in the indictment as co-conspirators, but who were not formally indicted. In late 2008, and actually, well, let me find it here. There we go. This was when they were sentenced on May 27th, but if you look down here, it says they were indicted here. This Holy Land Foundation for Relief and Development and five of its leaders following their convictions by a federal jury in November 2008 and on charges of providing material support to Hamas, a designated foreign terrorist organization. So they were actually convicted in November of 2008, and then they were sentenced here May 27th of 2009, which was very good that at least they were under the Bush administration during that time. But let me go back here. Anyway, Louis does point that out. In late 2008, the DOJ got convictions against all those formally indicted, so DOJ could then move forward with formally indicting and convicting the rest, except that the November 2008 election meant it was now going to be the Obama DOJ with Eric Holder leading. The newly named but not confirmed Attorney General apparently made clear they were not going to pursue any of the named co-conspirators. That itself is a major loss for the United States in its war against terrorism in the Obama administration. It was a self-inflicted refusal to go after and defeat our enemies. All of the named co-conspirators would not likely have been formally indicted, but certainly there was evidence to support the allegations against some of them, as the Federal District Court and the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals had formally found. One of the problems with the FBI Director Mueller is that he had already been cozying up to named co-conspirators with evidence in hand of their collusion with terrorists. That probably was an assurance to President Obama and Attorney General Holder that Mueller would fit right into the Obama administration. 
he did, it also helps explain why President Obama and A.G. Holder wanted him to serve an extra two years as FBI director. Mueller was their kind of guy. Unfortunately for America, he truly was. So that's where I'm going to stop in the document because we got to talk about this Holy Land Foundation, okay? Well, there was a letter that was sent to Mueller after the whole care thing when they were talking about it. And this was February 24th. So this is before they were actually sentenced, but they'd already been convicted. So uh, this is what it says. And supposedly that new way of dealing with care had been implemented, supposedly. So, dear Mr. Mueller, over the past couple of weeks, we have read with interest reports that the FBI has severed its ties to the Council on American Islamic Relations, CARE. We certainly support that action, and it would be helpful to us to understand the situation more fully. For example, would your field offices have the same policy? And are there any reservations or exceptions in your policy? And since the Bureau has taken a leadership role, do you know whether other federal government agencies still have ties to CARE? And are they aware of the Bureau's decision? Obviously, we believe this should be government-wide policy. Finally, given CARE's status as an unindicted co-conspirator in the Holy Land Foundation case, we would like to know more about other unindicted co-conspirators. Does the Bureau have any other contacts with organizations or individuals identified by federal prosecutors as unindicted co-conspirators in terrorism finance investigations? And were those contacts affected by the decision to sever ties with CARE? We have appreciated the opportunity to work with you in the past and hope to continue to provide the tools you need to help keep this country safe. But look who signed it. Okay, we've got John Kyle here and then we've got Tom Coburn. Those two are Republicans. But look who's in the middle. Yeah, Chuck Schumer signed this. So at this time, this was back in 2009, evidently the whole idea of being buddy-buddy with Muslim terrorists was something that Chuck Schumer stood against. Yeah, too bad he's changed. Yeah. Anyway, and then, like I said, May 27th is when they were actually sentenced. And, you know, basically they were sentenced like for mm, 65 years in prison. I think all of them were, um, well, this one got 15, but 65 years was pretty standard. And they were convicted on conspiracy to provide and provision of material support to a designated foreign terrorist organization, counts of conspiracy to provide and the provision of funds, goods, and services to a specifically designated terrorist, and 10 counts of conspiracy to commit and commission of money laundering, one count of conspiracy to impede and impair the Internal Revenue Service, and one count of filing a false tax return. And most of them had similar things, you know, they, they picked out, not all of them had exactly the same charges, but there were several, oh, here's another 15 years, but yeah, oh, it was a big mess. Now, I have to actually say that I had never heard of this Holy Land Foundation. Yep, don't remember that at all. But um, it evidently was something pretty big. Well, I came across these two videos. This is part one, and then there's another that's part two that will give you a real quick overview of the trial. Well, a piece of information from the trial. And like I said, this is 16 minutes, and the other one's not very long either, 13 minutes. They're both pretty short, and, you know, this guy isn't a big channel here. He doesn't have a lot of views on it, but I thought both of them were very well done, and he presents them in a, a good, clear, coherent way, and, you know, it's just good information. But the document he's referring to is this right here. And it's an explanatory memorandum on the general strategic goal for the group in North America. Okay, and you see the date on there, 5-22-91. Now, the top part of it, the reason I'm starting on page 16 is because the first, like, 14 pages are all in Arabic. Well, actually, probably 15. And then this page, you see some of the Arabic. I mean, the rest of it's just, like, all Arabic. 
but there's a translation. And that's what we're going to go through, okay? And you can see all these different organizations that were set up. It's a little scary, really, when you see this and then when you see what I'm going to reveal to you. Because this is the part that's like, what? Oh, so these organizations, when you see these, know that they are part of the people that put together this document and they were created by these people. Well, the people that created this document, yep, getting down there. Oh, here's what the document has in it. An introduction and explanation, the concept of settlement, the process of settlement, comprehensive settlement organizations. So that's what we just saw, the settlement organizations. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, uh, yeah. And it's written by a Muslim who was in charge of this and he wanted to seize their attention and look what he says what might have encouraged me to submit the memorandum in the, in this time in particular is my feeling of a glimpse of hope and the beginning of good tidings which bring the good news that we have embarked on a new stage of islamic activism stages in this continent and it means the united states okay and you have to remember that as you're reading through this that this was written by them this was kind of like their playbook that they disseminated to their settlers i guess you would call them and um yeah it's uh creepy 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 anyway as you come down here you start to see some of the stuff that they're doing and this, the memorandum is derived from the general strategic goal of the group in America, which was approved by the Shura Council and the Organizational Conference for the year 1987, is enablement of Islam in North America, meaning establishing an effective and a stable Islamic movement led by the Muslim Brotherhood, which adopts Muslims' causes domestically and globally, and which works to expand the observant Muslim base, aims at unifying and directing Muslims' efforts, presents Islam as a civilization alternative, and supports the global Islamic State wherever it is. Wow. <laughs> I mean, really. And this was entered, this document right here was entered in as evidence in the trial. So it was, you know, part of the evidence. So it is their document. They did not contest that. And <laughs> I mean, this stuff, when you start going through this, it's like, yeah, establishing an effective and stable Islamic movement led by the Muslim Brotherhood adopting Muslims' causes domestically and globally, expanding the observant Muslim base, unifying and directing Muslims' efforts, presenting Islam as a civilization alternative. Yeah, that's the alternative, huh? I'm going to say no to the alternative. <laughs> Supporting the establishment of the global Islamic state. I think that right there, the global Islamic state, wherever it is, Kind of scary. But anyway, if you, if you look at this, you see that they're talking about settlement. Here's the actual plan. Settlement, that Islam and its movement become a part of the homeland it lives in. Establishment, that Islam turns into firmly rooted organizations on whose basis civilization, structure, and testimony are built. Stability. That Islam is stable in the land on which its people move. Enablement. That Islam is enabled within the souls, minds, and the lives of the people of the country in which it moves. Enabled within the souls, minds, and lives. Hmm. And rooting. Think about rooting. Yeah, I, I like to garden. And so I'm thinking of those roots going down deep so the plant can't be pulled up easily. That Islam is resident and not a passing thing or rooted, entrenched in the soil of the spot where it moves and not a strange plant to it. Think about this. I mean, this is their plan. And then they go through 
and they talk about it. In order for Islam and its movement to become a part of the homeland in which it lives, stable in its land, rooted in the spirits and minds of its people, enabled in the lives of its society, and has firmly established organizations on which the Islamic structure is built and with which the testimony of civilization is achieved, the movement must plan and struggle to obtain the keys and the tools of this process in carrying out this grand mission as a civilization jihadist responsibility, which lies on the shoulders of Muslims and on top of them, the Muslim Brotherhood in this country. Okay, folks, that says it right there. It is a civilization jihadist responsibility. That's what they consider it. I mean, they just say it right there. Anyway, you go on and it's the same basic thing. This is what they were going to do. And they tell more in detail. And one of the plans was to, you know, get to the point where it wasn't just the first generation, that it was the children of the original generation that would work their way into government. Gee, have we seen that happen? Yeah. Anyway... So I will leave this document down below. You can go through and read more of it on your own, but this is what they're doing. This is what this whole thing was. And the organization was called the Holy Land Foundation for Relief and Development. And I'll include this document too, so you can look through it. It's a really good article that, that kind of sums up what really happened. And here's the link to that document that I just showed you. But it was by the Muslim Brotherhood operative Mohammed Akram. So the federal investigators found this memo in this guy's house. So, and it was by this Akram. So, yeah, it was written sometime in 1987, but not formally published until May 22nd, 1991. And it's only 18 pages long, but like I said, the first 18 pages are all in Arabic. And unless you speak Arabic, not going to help you a whole lot. So it's actually double that because the second part is the English. And so anyway, this article just kind of points out what they were doing. If you want to know, this was the Muslim Brotherhood trying to get into the United States, and they still are trying to implement that. But this was when seven key leaders of is an Islamic charity known as the Holy Land Foundation for Relief and Development went on trial for charges that they had provided material support and resources to Hamas. That was the whole point. And they were laundering money and yeah, and they were doing it all as a nonprofit organization. So they got tax break. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And by the way, look at this. It says the U.S. government released a list of approximately 300 unindicted co-conspirators. So when they were talking about these unindicted co-conspirators, they were talking about like 300 people. I mean, it was not just five or six little guys. No, 300. I mean, wow. It's just amazing. But anyway... I wanted to point that out to you. And then here's the little extras. I found this article that I think is really good to read because when it comes to Islam, I have nothing against Muslims themselves, but I've read the Quran and I know that the Quran does not mesh with our constitution in many, many ways. And I thought this article did a good job of showing why the Quran and the Constitution are just not compatible. And we need to remember that because we had some congressmen that when they were sworn in, instead of having their hand on the Bible, they put their hand on the Quran. Well, if you're going to swear on that document, then that document had better be compatible with our Constitution. Shouldn't it be? Well, that's the thing. And here it says, how can one swear to defend something upon a book that promotes the opposite? And when you go through, by the way, surah, if you don't know anything about the Quran, surah is like the word for verse, if you're familiar with how the Bible works. And so the number of the surah, and then this is the verse in that surah. And then there 
they also have, besides the Quran, they also have something called the Hadith. And those are like extra books that they also consider holy, just not quite as big as the Quran. Um, although some of them really put a lot of stock in the Hadiths. But yeah, so again, this was something extra, but it's still considered important to their faith. And when you read some of this stuff, you know, it's just scary how it contradicts our amendments and our constitution. So I wanted to leave that. I'm going to leave that one down below for you so you can check it out. And then I am also going to include the link to this article because I thought this was really interesting. If you know anything about the Marine Corps anthem, you know, that they talk about from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Well, if you've ever wondered about that, this actually tells you about it. But the reason I mostly wanted to share this article with you is because that's quite interesting. It tells you about that statue, the monument. And um, this is a really good article, by the way. Anyway, let me find it down here. Because the very first Quran, see, there he is. That's, that's Ellison when he was swearing on the Quran. And look how happy Nancy looks. Yeah, they all look pretty happy that he's swearing on something that's contradictory to our constitution. But hey, you know, and so it's in here somewhere. I'm getting there. I didn't click off of it. There it is. Ah, knew it was there. Okay. The very first Quran ever printed in the United States was actually printed by John Adams. And he had it printed up for a specific purpose. And here's what it says. <laughs> this is the introduction, the preamble of it. This book is a long conference of God, the angels, and Muhammad, which that false prophet very grossly invented. Sometimes he introduceth God who speaketh to him and teacheth him his law, then an angel among the prophets and frequently maketh God to speak in the plural. Thou wilt wonder that such absurdities have infected the best part of the world and wilt avouch that the knowledge of what is contained in this book will render that law contemptible. Okay. Essentially what they were doing is they were having fights with the Muslims over in the Middle East. Well, along the Barbary coast. And that's where we had some issues because they were like pirating things. The Muslims would attack our ships and merchant ships and they would take stuff, you know, and, and just plunder them essentially. And it was a big deal. So they, they put a tax on us in order. It was like a protection tax. So it was like a mafia, you know? And so they put this protection tax on us. Well, the government had to tax the American people because of it. Well, then the American people start getting pretty ticked off that they had to be taxed to give these pirates this money. And so, and protection, you know, to just be protected, to ha not have their ships attacked. So eventually, that's where our Navy came in. And yes, our Marines, and they kicked some butt over there. <laughs> And it stopped the whole protection blackmail scheme that was going on. So that's what this whole thing is about. I thought it was fun to read. It was interesting. And I knew about that. I was looking for that quote right there because that is what starts it. And I thought there was something else too as a part of it that said the purpose for having that printed in the United States was to, to study what their enemy believed. And so it was very obvious that that was not something that they expected people to believe in. It was something they expected people to know about so they could understand these people that were fighting against them and they could stand up against them. So knowledge, knowledge is very important. And they wanted to know what their enemies believed. So I didn't find that part. I'm still looking for it. If you find it, let me know. Because I can't find the single quote. I I used to have it bookmarked. I can't find it now. So anyway, uh, like I said, I had those for you. And then I have one last thing I just want to show you. Yep, Chucky e. Schumer is just, he says, Why is President Donald Trump more critical of Baltimore than he is of Putin in Moscow? 
it, it it was just too funny looking at all the responses because the responses are basically, hey, idiot, because he's the president of the United States. And so he cares what's going on in his country. <laughs> I mean, that's just too funny. And it was not just one person. It was like person after person after person. And, you know, like this one, Trump cares about America. You were the ones obsessed with Russia, <laughs> probably why you colluded with them. <laughs> and why aren't Dems demanding to know where all our money went over $16 billion? And it just was person after person. It just goes on and on. And so I just wanted to share that with you. I thought it was pretty funny. I'll put the link down below. You can go in and chime in on that if you got Twitter. It's always fun to do. But yeah, you know, they're trying their best just to blame Trump for everything. It's like... Why would he be more critical of Putin in Moscow? Because that's not his country. He's not worried about his country. He's worried about people robbing American citizens. And his job as the president of the United States is to take care of his American citizens. So it just boggles my mind that Chuck Schumer can't figure that one out. So anyway, I'll leave all the links down below because there's a ton of them. And some of it's really good reading. I would take the time to go through them all, but, you know, it would take forever. And I'm tired. So, anyway. Oh, and for those of you who are praying people, I do want to ask a little prayer request here. I had a friend who was hit in a car accident and killed um, on Friday of this last Friday. I really would like prayer for his family because... His family, there's there's three boys in his family. His mom's divorced, and so she's kind of a single parent who brought him up. And the oldest son was killed in a car accident when he was 17. This one was 29, the day after his 29th birthday, and he was killed. He was a flagger, and somebody was an idiot as they were driving through the construction zone. So please be careful when you're doing that. Those are real people out there, and they leave families. So, yeah, that's what happened. And then there's the third son who is feeling kind of lost right now, too, because he always had his older brother to take care of him. And so it's been it's been really tough. And it's hard for a mother to have to go through losing one son and then to go through losing a second one. So if you could just pray for that family, um, you know, the mother's name is Joe and the brother who's left is Nick. So for those of you who are praying people, I would appreciate that. Thank you so much. And so anyway, I'm sorry to end on that note, but uh, this is what I've got for you on this one. I do have more coming and the document goes on. That's page 31, I think is where we're at. So yeah, there's more to come. This is just incredible. The kind of stuff that these people were involved in, like Mueller. I mean, yeah, let's cozy up with all the Muslim Brotherhood people and care and Hamas. Yeah, let's support Hamas. But those of you who follow the 17th letter of the alphabet, you know that that is part of what's going on and there's a bigger picture. So anyway, that's what I've got for you on this one. I want to thank you for stopping by and I'll see y'all later.